If you go online to ask for help working out why your corals are dying, all too often the response will be that you should start by upgrading your LEDs, dosing various randomly selected trace elements, or pouring in coral food. And while it can sound far sexier to fix your problems by buying good bacteria, phytoplankton, amino acids, or any other bottle of whatever is flavor of the month on Instagram, the reality is that ensuring you've got the basics right will fix 99% of all problems with your corals. And whenever I've had problems in my 40 gallon LPS tank, it's always been caused by one of five factors. So today I'll share with you my experience of the five most common causes of problems with LPS corals. First up is one of two water parameters on this list, magnesium. It's often said that LPS corals prefer elevated levels of magnesium, somewhere around 1350 parts per million or above. And whenever my magnesium has dipped too far below that level, some of my LPS corals start to sulk. My magnesium levels did get as low as 1050 parts per million on this tank, and as soon as I elevated it back up to 1250, there was an instant improvement in the health of my corals. I find retracted polyps to be a common sight when magnesium is low, or shriveling in the case of more meaty corals, like this trachophilia. Now it's easy to take your eyes off magnesium and get complacent if your results don't change for several weeks, so I now try to think of all of my corals as being a canary in a coal mine, and when any of them start sulking, I run a full suite of tests to see if this is the start of a wider problem or just an isolated issue with one coral. And next up is shrimp. Last year I bought a peppermint shrimp to take care of a few Aptasia anemones that had popped up, but he instantly decided my torch corals were far tastier, so he went all chop suey on my most expensive coral. I moved him to my Fluval Evo for a month, then moved the torch over briefly to see what would happen, which turned out to be just as stupid an idea as it sounds. But even away from coral eating shrimp, my cleaner shrimp often steal food from my LPS corals, which often results in some level of tissue damage, especially with hammer corals, which I find lose fleshy tips more easily than my other LPS corals. And this is part of the reason that I don't target feed my LPS corals anymore, and if I were to start this tank again, I'd even consider going shrimp free. Although I should add that coral eating fish are even more likely to be a problem, and my copper banded butterfly demonstrates all of my green acans in my main tank. So watch out for fish like foxface and certain tangs going rogue. Number three on my list of the most common causes of LPS problems is warfare. And of course LPS corals are a lot more aggressive than SPS corals and they don't need asking twice to send out stinging sweeper tentacles. This WWC Stellaria chalice is the worst offender in my tank and sends out mesenterial filaments to dissolve any of its neighbors that get too close. And the Stellaria is what caused the damage to this Raja Rampage chalice and we're forever Ever reclassifying corals in this hobby, so it's not always possible to simply keep corals that you think are of the same genus next to each other. And I had to move this blue gonny on because its polyps were never extended while it was next to this green gonny. It recovered within a few days of being moved away, and it was the same story for this short tentacle pink gonny that was another victim of the green gonny, which incidentally plays nicely with my red gonny. Go figure. My penultimate killer of LPS corals is too much light. Now while I have two strip lights on this tank as well as a primary central light, the castle peaks at only 30% and the already low power AI blades peak at just 50%, so combined with the fact that the lights are 12 inches off the water surface, my par doesn't get much higher than 150, which is ideal for an LPS tank. But in my main tank where par is over double that, almost all of my LPS corals struggle. Acans in particular don't grow, don't show great color, and don't puff up anywhere like they should do. The best example of which is this Acan, which is getting far too much light in my SPS tank, compared with this Acan in my LPS tank, which gets much less light. Now because I've got lighting right on my LPS tank, I rarely have any issues because of high par, but anytime one of my LPS corals is struggling, they always appreciate being moved to a lower light spot. And if you're ever in doubt, when it comes to LPS corals and light, less is more. And my number one cause of problems with LPS corals is salinity. And my LPS corals have absolutely suffered the most when my salinity has been off and it is now the first thing I check when any of my corals sulk. A spike in salinity up from 35 parts per thousand to 38 parts per thousand was responsible for killing one of my torch corals and for leaving various other corals on the verge of death, a position from which many haven't recovered months down the line. My salinity issue started when my HANA salinity tester started to lose its accuracy and was even giving false readings immediately after I'd calibrated it. So I didn't notice that was the problem until I double checked with an optical refractor 
photometer. The Hanna pen reads low, which meant I'd be mixing up new salt at 38 parts per thousand, when the Hanna told me it was 35 parts per thousand. And over time that's led to a few salinity spikes that have in turn caused major issues with my corals. And while salinity issues will cause similar symptoms to the other causes on this list, the most extreme reactions in my tank are always down to salinity spikes. And it's the one thing I've found that kills corals faster than anything else. And in the past, I've assumed my salinity is fine because my tester said it was, and because salinity tends to look after itself with my auto top off and regular water changes. But now if I'm ever having issues with any of my corals, whether SPS or LPS, salinity is the first place I double check, and I've learned the hard way to be skeptical of all testing equipment. Now it is entirely possible that whatever is upsetting your corals is something more obscure than the top five items on this list. But this hobby is far more simple than we make it out to be, and I've had much more success recovering sick corals by simply following the basics. And coral problems are the same as personal problems, in that you won't find the answer at the bottom of a bottle. Now if you've got any questions, let me know in the comment section below, and if you enjoyed the video, give me a thumbs up and subscribe for next time, and until then, happy reefing.